People pay $100 for a steak, but they're not gonna pay more than $24 for a chicken at Jardiniere. The restaurant industry, we keep seven cents of every dollar. Wait, 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 let me let me get this straight. So you do a million in a month, you only keep in 75 grand. Yep. If we don't see that $120 billion aid package go to restaurants, we will see an extinction event of about 65 to 70% of restaurants that just won't make it. Forget the $120 billion, doesn't pass. Who takes the biggest hit? Hospitality employment is going to keep crashing. This is getting worse. It's not getting better. That's a pretty bold statement you just made right there. That's not a small statement. Right? I want my industry to survive, but to do so, I think it has to shut down. The vaccine is not going to be ready. How do we unpack that $120 billion to not say, we need to do another one 90 days later and 90 days later? Think of the economic drain. All those people on unemployment, all those people without health insurance, we're the second largest industry in America, second only to the US government. Two big to fail. Americans are dying by the thousands and we're all on a leaderless ship. It's fair to say you don't have a picture of President Trump on that wall. Quarantine orders, theater closures, all that kind of stuff is going to further dampen restaurant spending. How long do you think it's going to take till we get there? Three months, six months, four months, or you don't know? I do know. I can tell you almost exactly. So my guest today is an American culinary expert, chef, restaurateur, television personality, radio personality. You may know him from his famous show, uh, Bizarre Foods with Andrew Zimmerman. I think it was on for 10, 11, 12, maybe 13 years, I think from 2006, I want to say 2018. And he's back February 2020 with MSNBC in February, a show called What's Eating America and another show that's going to be coming out that's currently in production. It's called Family Dinner will air on the forthcoming Magnolia Network. My guest today, Andrew Zimmern. Andrew, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, goodness. So what do you think about all these restaurants going out of business? Uh, it's a cultural catastrophe. It's an economic catastrophe. It's a uh, one of the saddest things that I've ever seen. Um, because like so many of the issues <clears throat> that are uh, turning sideways and going underwater in America right now, it, it, the vast majority of it was preventable. Um, the leadership gap uh, coming out of Washington, D.C. Uh, is uh, responsible for a lack of money flowing to states. And forget about the different acts that are all trying to help various small businesses. And I do believe in the what's now called the Restaurants Act that's specifically designed to bolster the 650,000 independent restaurants uh, around America. By the way, an industry that is second largest in America, second only to the US government, right? A trillion dollar industry that represents 4% of GDP. So definitely one that is uh, worth aiding. But the lack of money to the, to the states and municipalities means that they can't spread money around to allow for restaurants that can't afford it to begin to reorganize both dining rooms and most importantly, kitchens, back a house and take care of workers. So that really any opening right now is jeopardizing uh, human life. Um, I do believe uh, in the, uh, the 239 scientists that sent a letter to the WHO that asked the body to recognize airborne transmission of COVID-19. Uh, and, and the difference there is that rather than just being transmitted uh, through our respiratory systems, the virus can linger in the air indoors, uh, infecting those nearby. There's so much we don't know about this uh, virus. And so the restaurants have been pivoting one way, then pivoting another, then pivoting another way, then pivoting another. Rules are different everywhere. Um, and I think this is where the role in a, if, if not during a public health emergency, then then when does a government uh, have a national federal government have the role to step in and help backstop uh, small businesses, including independent restaurants? So, yeah, it, it's uh, I think it's it's horrific. And quite frankly, if we don't see the Restaurants Act passed, that's the one that Congressman Blumenauer in the House and. Uh, Wicker and Sinema in the Senate have backed. If we don't see that $120 billion aid package go to restaurants, we will see 
without a doubt, an extinction event of about 65 to 70 percent of restaurants that just won't make it. That's a pretty bold statement you just made right there. That's not a small statement right there. No, it's it's not. And and it's the it's actually the same statement that I've made since the beginning of March. Um, and, and I'm also not alone. This is um, I, I'm not staring into a crystal ball. This isn't guesswork um, by their own admission. Uh, restaurateurs, uh, statistically, it, they have come up with a figure of about 80% of restaurants not being able to reopen. Now, since that poll came out, that was a James Beard Foundation poll that was quite extensive. Since that poll came out, a lot of people have pivoted and found other resources of income. And, you know, I bet if that poll went out today, I think 70, 65% of them would say without additional income uh, or aid, we're not going to be able to uh, survive. So I think that number has gone up a little bit as people have realized that there are other ways to make money with food. Uh, but you got to remember, everyone is locked into rents. They're locked into their insurance packages, their utilities packages, the uh, perhaps payments on equipment, um, loans to banks and investors. So you, they, you can't continue to exist on 25, 35, 40, 50 percent of income. And at the same time, if they if restaurants aren't really, really cautious and this is where I I it's not that I'm talking out of two sides of my mouth. It's that I want my industry to survive, but to do so. I think it has to shut down. And the reason is, is that if we develop hotspots in restaurants and if the public has a perception because of some uh, less than responsible operators uh, ruining it for everyone, uh, which I'm seeing right now here in Minneapolis, I am worried that a hotspot develops and then consumer demand drops because they think restaurants in general are problematic when in fact it's any place people are gathering is problematic. You know, we, we just yesterday had the worst uh, day in terms of uh, COVID-19 statistics in the entire history of the pandemic. This is getting worse. It's not getting better. So it puzzles me why we're talking about opening businesses and opening schools. Um, it, it almost feels like a, a, a genocidal uh, betrayal to me. I mean, we are... Americans are dying by the thousands every day in America, and we have a we're we're all on a leaderless ship. I'm glad you're not getting very political today. You're sticking to the business. It's very, <laughs> I, I, I sense the diplomatic side of you today. Very impressive. Well, it's I mean I mean look I've got to be honest with you. I mean it's it's both. I don't see things through a lens that isn't civic, and you know I think civics touches everything that we do. Civic solutions oftentimes are political ones. And I think that's hard for folks to understand. I think people want to avoid talking about uh, politics. I think they want to avoid talking about subjects that make them uncomfortable. It's one of the reasons why I made What's Eating America. Um, I wanted to talk about subjects that made people uncomfortable, but I also wanted people to learn and be entertained while they were being made uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I referred to it once in a meeting as a roller, coach, uh, roller coaster. Uh, you know, you're scared. It's going up in the middle of the whole thing. You're saying, I'll never do that again. And you get off and someone says, how was it? And you say, let's go again. I, I think that it's important that we have these discussions now more than ever. So, so let me ask you this, because you said a lot of different things there. And a lot of it had to do with leadership at the top, which is directed towards Trump. And uh, it's very obvious you're against businesses opening up due to cases being up. Uh, 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 your concern is if we do open up, it's going to be disastrous. So you want $120 billion to go into the 650,000 restaurants open, that 80% of them don't shut down, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Fine. We know your position. Here's my question for you. Uh, 15 million people work in a restaurant business. Okay. Half of all adults at what point, at one point worked at a restaurant. I did. Obviously you're in it. One third of Americans first job was at a restaurant. 10% of nation's workforce is employed at a restaurant. This is not a small number. You said a trillion dollars, $900 billion to uh, uh, be exact. It's a very big number we're talking about. My question for you becomes, who takes the biggest hit? Say the $120 billion doesn't go out. Forget the $120 billion. Doesn't pass. It's not going out. Andrew, who takes the biggest hit? Customers, servers, owners, food suppliers, uh, America, 
who ends up taking the biggest hit in this industry, in this situation? Uh, America does. And, and I'll tell you why. And I think that owners, uh, owners almost last. And, and let me talk about that first. Um, there are a lot of owners in the restaurant business that have other businesses. They're corporate restaurants, chain restaurants, investment groups, et cetera. They're going to find other projects. Obviously, the independent restaurant owner, the, you know, you and I are partners. I'm in the kitchen. You're in the front of the house. We put our life savings in. That was 15 years ago. We've made money. We've raised kids. We have a catering business. We got, we have a nice thing going. We've got lots of employees and we are a stalwart in the community, right? Because remember, restaurants are the ones that are giving everywhere, right? Owners like us would be hit hard. And then so would the rest of America. And let me explain that. You cited a lot of uh, really great statistics uh, there that are super, super important for people to remember. Restaurants are also the number one employer of returning citizens coming out of jails and institutions, number one employer of single mothers, one of the top two employers of immigrants. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. As I said before, the only industry bigger than restaurants is the pen is the U.S. government. So w- what does that mean? Well, unlike airlines, unlike cruise ship industries, unlike banks, unlike you know a lot of other businesses that hold on to vast amounts of money, the restaurant industry averages 93% pass-through. Essentially, we keep seven cents of every dollar. And of that seven cents, two and a half cents of every dollar usually goes back into employee subsidy programs like uh, paid sick leave to workers and, and things like that, as restaurants have begun to see the importance of this. So when these restaurants go, you know who goes along with it? All of those winemakers, all of those clam boats, all the fishermen, all the people who are raising chickens and ducks that have been sold into restaurants, the restaurant boom, especially the independent restaurant boom of the last 20 years has created communities of producers, suppliers, the napkin vendors. I mean, you name it, it affects it. Then there's the money going out the backside. Since we're the second largest employer in America collectively, think of the economic drain. All those people on unemployment, All those people without health insurance, right? All of those people uh, that are going to put a strain on different segments of our economy. The if if I am not an economist, but the ones that I speak to when I start to have this conversation with them, look at me and and basically tell me that we're looking at an apocalyptic event. Now I'm not I'm not saying that I believe a certain industry should go out of business willingly, but I'm just going to draw a comparison. If an airline went bankrupt, one of 20 you know, domestic carriers in here, others would step into the void, right? That's not the case with restaurants, right? When If, if they're going to go, we're going to go in a massive number because we're all in the exact same economic constraints. And so you're looking at something that will affect Main Street USA. We pay so much in taxes. Remember, Cruise ships got backstopped. They don't. They pay like one and a half percent in American taxes because all of them have figured out a way to to be offshore companies. Um, it, we collect liquor taxes, pay sales taxes. We we are the backbone of tourism. Nobody goes to San Francisco to get a sandwich at Panera. You go to San Francisco to eat at the great restaurants or New York. When I travel to Omaha, I, I I'm going and I'm trying to figure out what the best restaurant is there. So the the bottom line is there's so many industries codependent and woven within it. You're looking, and and while you cited this trillion-dollar industry uh, number, it's really multiple trillions of dollars when you add on hotels, hospitality, all the farm workers, et cetera, and you start to get up to about 50 million people uh, that the food and hospitality system employs. And I'm afraid of the ripple effect for $120 billion, a, which I know sounds like a lot of money, is a very small price to pay to avoid the multiple trillion dollar problem that we would face if those restaurants went under. So I got a follow-up question for you, Greg. And that was uh, very uh, uh, crystal clear on the way you explained that. So the way it's going right now with cases, okay, cases are going up, 
And the level of trust in America is right now not high. If you look at the TSA stats of travel, last year today, we had 2.7 million travelers. Today, we have, what, 600,000, according to TSA reports that are coming up. We haven't recovered fully to the 2.7 to 2.2 million. The low we hit was 87,000 back in April, which we've come seven times that, which is great news to see progress in a span of three months. But here's my question for you. Do you think, how long do you think it's going to take until we go back to 100% of restaurants being open and us being, a, being able to go back to Friday night, just go to a restaurant. Oh, it's not at 50%. It's at 100%. It's open up. How long do you think it's going to take till we get there? Three months, six months, 12 months, or you don't know? Uh, I, I do know. Uh, I can tell you almost exactly. Um, about nine months after a vaccine that uh, is effective to 85% of the population. Okay. Now, okay. now that might, I mean, look, we, the great thing about capitalism is that we have a global pandemic. If you and I were in any kind of medical device or pharma company right now, we would be going all guns trying to be the first one if we had a, a, a part of our business that could help figure out a cure for this because there's money to be made at it, right? And uh, I honestly think, because I'm very pro-business, um, I honestly think that this is where capitalism serves us so well. Uh, if we can come up with a vaccine that works 85% of the time, my fear is we get one with side effects that only works 65 or 70% of the time. Not that I wouldn't take that and it couldn't be imp improved upon. Uh, I certainly would. But if we got one, that was effective 85% of those uh, vaccinated. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that it's nine months after that, we go through uh, a cycle of seasons in America, which is nine months. Um, I think that you would see consumer demand return. And that's really the, that's really the core issue here. When does consumer demand match its levels that it was before? Right. So you, you mentioned travel. I mean, well, business has to start picking up there. Right. The vast majority of uh, people who are using the airlines are business travelers. Right. Top 10 percent of customers are responsible for like 60 percent of uh, airline uh, revenue, something like that. So but we're looking at business taking on a different shape these days. I, I have friends that look at, uh, work in, uh, you know, Fortune 50 Minnesota companies, you know, like General Mills and, and Best Buy and stuff like that. Uh, 3M, every Cargill, well, yeah, Cargill, every single one of them tells me that they're never going back to work the way they did before. It's all going to be flex time or time at home because these companies are figuring out a way to get things done via uh, tech that they were sort of afraid to do before. You know, the, the the virus forced everyone's hand to get real familiar with how to run a Zoom meeting, right? And guess what? They figured out it worked. And they found out that even though everyone is working 10% slower, the savings on the real estate is massive. So we'd rather have people have a better lifestyle. Sure, work at home and we will, uh, we will soldier forth. With restaurants, you've got this consumer demand issue that is correlated to how safe we feel being out in public amongst each other and that we feel the places that we're going are custodians of the public health. Restaurants historically for the last two generations have been licensed entities. In other words, health department has to license them. There has to be a licensed health sanitarian on premise at all times. You usually have two or three members of your staff take the health department test. We, we know what it takes and what it means to serve food uh, and keep the public uh, safe that way. But we have to learn a whole new system here when it comes to a respiratory and what I believe is also uh, an airborne uh, transmission virus like uh, COVID-19. And I think the last thing that I would say to this, um, and it's why I, I link it to nine months past a, a workable vaccine, um, just over the last five or six days, and, and I'm on a whole bunch of committees here in the state of Minnesota and actively engaged in talking with uh, health commissioners and, and 
so on here in our state as we're working through some of the problems. And I'm on a lot of national committees as well. Um, we're finding as the uh, pathologists are able to work on people who have passed away from C19, um, that uh, all organs are damaged in people who've passed from this disease. It's not just fibroids in the lungs. We also know that people who have recovered, especially young people have recovered, uh, not only have permanent lung damage, but we're also looking at a neurological effect uh, reports out of the uh, UK with some really reliable uh, studies over there are showing that there could be long-term uh, uh, effects on brain function associated with people who contract C19, perhaps related to length of illness. You know, some people get better in five weeks. Some people are sick for three or four months. Um, the point being, there's so much we don't know about it. And, and this affects all businesses where the public gathers. If you and I own a shoe store, we're selling online. Eventually, everyone learns to buy shoes online. It just It's eventually going to be the way it happens. I think what you're talking about, though, is that pleasurable aspect where you and I are grabbing a couple friends and going out and socializing and spending a night in a restaurant. I've been addicted to that feeling since I was 14 years old. If I think about it too much, I'll start to cry. That I got hooked as an early teen shucking oysters in a clam house in East Hampton, Long Island, because the, the, I, I watched what, you know, the, the tray of icy briny oysters that I set down on the counter was taken by a server to a table. Then you could see how happy it made people. And it, it, flipped a switch inside me that's never left. It's probably even stronger now, 45 years later, that people can't enjoy that feeling is killing me. I can't wait to get back to that Friday night. I'm just worried that we, we, need, we need the type of leadership that says to everyone, line up behind me, we're marching over that hill, and we're not going to stop. We're going to spend every dollar, fight every battle until we knock this thing back. And we're going to help every, you know, there's 350 some odd million Americans here today. I mean, you know, I, I, I had no favorite in the, you know, in politics. I haven't endorsed a candidate or anything yet. But the mathematics that Andrew Yang was talking about, where we give each American a certain amount of dollars now, in light of the of the trillions of dollars that the government has given to corporations and all of these different uh, backstopping acts passed by Congress, boy, oh boy, if we had given that out to actual citizens to start to make it through this disease, we might have made a better choice. You know, that is a form of an endorsement, Larry. But I'll tell you something, We're talking about, uh, 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 you know, the data of the pathologist talking about in Europe that is showing signs and symptoms of long-term effects and, you know, what this could do to somebody in different areas. It's kind of the argument of what some of the anti-vax guys say that, you know, the long-term effects of vaccine has autism. So there's a concern right now about driving the vaccine or forcing people to take it without a lot of testing, especially all the testing that they're going through. But the reason when I was asking this question for you, when you said, how long do you think it'll take? until we will go back to normal, right? How long it'll take until we go back to normal? So right now, you got 155 vaccines that are being tested right now, going against uh, uh, coronavirus. 22 are in human trials right now. You heard Novavax yesterday, which is good news. Novavax yesterday got a $1.6 billion funding from the government, not yesterday, three days ago, and the stock went up 42%, which is progress. We're going in the right direction. And you're seeing other people that are fighting to get into that uh, conversation. If you're saying nine months after a vaccine comes out, so let's unpack that. The vaccine is not going to be ready for people to take. Probably they're saying fourth quarter, but let's just say Q1. I think Q1 is probably more conservative. And let's just say February Q1. Little aggressive, little conservative. We'll go right in the middle. Okay. A year, a year from when we first got. Oh, absolutely. I'm with you. Okay, you're, and you, originally Fauci, if you remember, he said 12 to 18 months. Well, let's just say 12 months. That's aggressive. February, we got it. Fair. Then you're saying nine months. So that's November, okay? So if it's nine months, November, now we're talking from today, July, 
August, September, October, November for 16 months till we go back to 100%. Uh, I'm, I'm, my mindset is 2022, but we're going fourth quarter of uh, 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 2021. Fair. That $120 billion to give to restaurants in an industry that's a $900 billion, trillion dollar industry per year, you're going to have to do another one 90 days later, another one 90 days later, another one 90 days later. So the, the math, it, you seem very, uh, uh, one of the things I enjoy about talking to you is the fact that you've done a lot of research about this. And by the way, you sound like you should be sitting on a committee giving advice on restaurants. And I'm talking, I'm talking from the White House because, you know, for someone like me, I want to, I want to learn from you. How do we unpack that $120 billion to not say we need to do another one 90 days later and 90 days later? Great question. Um, you know, we we spent a lot of time at the Independent Restaurant Coalition, a group that I co-founded back in March. You know, about 60 or 70 of us got together and said we need to we need to change policy in Washington. We need to have a voice. Independent restaurants are going to be left behind. And we 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 banded together and we've grown ever since. People can check out uh, our uh, policy statements and the Restaurant Act itself. Um, I'm referring to the specific act that uh, Congressman Blumenauer introduced a couple of weeks ago. We have it on our website at saverestaurants.com. And we also have the math on our website at saverestaurants.com. The reason that we came up with that number is that there are many restaurants out there, corporate restaurants, places that are already found a successful way to pivot that wouldn't qualify to take as much money as restaurants that have been forced to close in certain areas in certain cities. Okay, that's number one. So it's not all restaurants getting the same amount of money. Number two, uh, restaurants owned by women, restaurants uh, owned by people of color uh, and indigenous communities get first bite at the apple because they have the least amount of access to the money from the banks, right? Statistically. So we're giving them first bite at the apple. We used a very complex formula, but essentially it is uh, a sort of minimum amount to keep afloat for 18 months minus your PPP, minus your PPP if you took it, is the amount of money that you get. So that in that restaurant that you and I own, we can pay our rent, we can pay our utilities, we can pay our insurance so that we are ready when people come back to work to actually hire them when there are customers to be there. If you and I happen to live in Laramie, Wyoming, where we have a successful restaurant, that's much different looking than Houston, Texas, or Miami, Florida right now, today, in July of 2020, right? Um, so uh, in Laramie, we might have customers. We might have a parking lot uh, that we can serve, you know, a hundred diners uh, a night and people willing to sit uh, socially distanced and wear masks and all the other stuff. We may be able to bring grills outside and grill steaks and serve simple vegetables and have people take advantage of it in the camaraderie of, of small town USA and with a desire to socialize and be with one another. Um, Profits from those dollars would then be subtracted from that. So we, we have all the metrics in hand. We know how that $120 billion is going to get spent. And we need to get to that money fast before more restaurants quit. One of the issues that um, we've had, and, we, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it every day, uh, uh, I see it a lot on social media. I follow so many chefs and so many restaurants just over the years. Every day I see another three or four that I follow that have said, no, I just can't do this uh, anymore. And it, it, it really shocks me, right? But I realize that, you know, restaurants that I'm involved in, I own, co-own, or am a partner in four or five different restaurants here in the Twin Cities. Uh, Two have yet to open. One has been doing uh, takeout and delivery. The other one hasn't. Uh, we've opened patio on one because it has one. We haven't opened patio on another because it doesn't have one. And we're waiting to see if we can open up. We're, we are going to open up if we're allowed to at 50% here in Minnesota because Minnesota is one of those states that's sort of at, at even. We've seen a small uptick uh, in numbers 
uh, but nothing that's taken off. And our governor has shown a lot of leadership. Governor Wall has really been amazing. But so many restaurants are folding already that we have a substantial number of restaurants. That statistical number of you know 650,000 independent restaurants that's out there, I, I, I have to imagine there's 75, 100,000 of them that aren't even open at all and never will open as of right now. So that number has gone down in terms of who needs the money. I think what's really hurting restaurants and what we have to remember is a whole network of effects that we're also trying to deal with. Number one, indoor dining in many cities could be a very long way off, right? Because it's different everywhere and we have this airborne transmission issue. Quarantine orders, travel restrictions, theater closures, you know, movie, I'm talking, not talking Broadway, you know, movie, all that kind of stuff is going to further dampen restaurant spending, right? People aren't going to be out and about in big major metros where the majority of people are, majority of restaurants in America uh, are. Um, the outdoor dining, delivery, and takeout business isn't a panacea for the industry. We mentioned it before in a long list of things, but it doesn't make up for, I mean, if you're a, if you're a business that's only taking 7.5% to the bottom line, you've got to be at 100% capacity, right? You've got to be back at those pre-COVID numbers. And, and look, many restaurants, we haven't even talked about this side, but you know it's true. Many restaurants were very fragile and brittle to begin with. When I started out in this business, I asked my godfather, Frank Granite, guy that owned a bunch of restaurants and got me jobs when I was 14, 15, 16 restaurants. I wanted to learn from him. And he had a three month prudent reserve at every restaurant. You know, the, the restaurants that I'm involved in, I mean, and I'm talking about really successful ones, there's no three and a half month prudent reserve. No one has, no one has one. Wait, 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 let me, let me get this straight. So you said seven and a half percent. Is that, is that EBITDA, EBITDA profit? That's like you, yep. you million and a million and keeping 75 grand. Yep. That's Rest- not a- Restaurants are extremely brittle and extremely fragile. And the reason, the reason is this, um, in, and I'm talking about independent restaurants. You can't, you know, the fair wage, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, fair trade coffee uh, movement that causes big coffee boom, right? Everyone was buying 75 cent cup of coffees at the local corner store. And then all of a sudden Starbucks and all these coffee shops started, you know, and now we all drink a $5 cup of coffee, Right. And one of the reasons that we do is that everyone really got involved on the social justice side of this, which was the fair trade program for beans, right? Let's help these small communities of farmers on these fincas all over throughout the coffee growing region by paying a fair trade price for the beans so that these villages could actually succeed, not just as a subsistence farmer, but as a successful farmer so that their communities could have schools and a clinic and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Right. But we're lagging behind that in the food business. I have a friend, Tracy Desjardins, one of the most famous chefs in the world, Michelin starred restaurant, Jardiniere in San Francisco, her flagship restaurant. She closed it last fall. I was interviewing her on a panel. I said, why did you close? She says, well, you know, we weren't making all that much money. And then at three, Three years ago, I, I really felt that I wanted to take a lot of the profits that we had, even though it wasn't much, and put it into uh, programs for my employees. Number one, because I wanted to take care of them, right? Like paid sick leave and stuff like that, uh, a bonus program, et cetera. She said, but also because the economy was getting better and better and better and better, unemployment was dropping, 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 employee retention was getting harder and harder and harder and rent was going up, right? We know, you know, I don't have to tell you about rent issues in San Francisco, New York, Seattle, where everything is through the roof. Employees are traveling an hour and a half into work to restaurants in the city. And they're just saying it's killing them. They're not making enough money. So she decided that she was going to raise her prices and actually charge enough money so that it was profitable. So when she opened, she said her half roast chicken, a really nice roast chicken, by the way, was like $17. Her costs had gone up over 25 years by X number of hundreds of percentage points, right? Rent, payroll, insurance, all the rest of that. 25 years she was in business. So you can imagine those costs going up. 
But the cost of her chicken, she still couldn't charge more than $24. She found that the minute she tried to go up above 20, despite the fact that to put the chicken on the plate and all the costs and, you know, the right fair cost for that chicken was like $32. No one's going to spend $32 for a half a chicken, right? You'll do it. People pay $100 for a steak because they would this special occasion at a steakhouse, but they're not going to pay more than $24 for a chicken at Jardiniere. And so we have artificially deflated food uh, prices all across our restaurant system. You know, it's that whole, whole dollar menu uh, mentality that has artificially def- brought down the cost of food. We're addicted to steak in the supermarket being a certain size and a certain color and have a certain, the muscle has to have a certain size to it. And we're not going to pay more than $9.99 a pound. It is, it's, it's causing problems in farming. It's causing problems in restaurants. Um, and you can't make a living on outdoor dining on to go and to take out and deliver. It just, it just doesn't work. Not in the, not with the lease that you and I have in our, uh, pretend restaurant and with our costs. Now, if we close that down and we move down the street to a place that's very undesirable from a storefront point of view, but we can do all the takeout and community kitchen and delivery from there because we're not seeing customers, then you and I have come up with a different business model, right? And that's part of the issue uh, as well. Um, restaurants have to dig themselves out of a rent hole. I mean, uh, the figures that I saw from New York City, from Roar, was that in New York, 73% of landlords did not waive rent in June. And 80% of New York restaurants did not pay their full rent in June, according to the surveys that Roar did and the Hospitality Alliance did. I mean, that, that's the, these are the kind of statistics that show you how fragile and brittle the industry is. And, and you have to remember, the PPP aid was only designed to be temporary, right? So we need something with a little more heft uh, to it, uh, like the restaurant stabilization bill that uh, Blumenauer and Wicker proposed in the House and Senate, respectively. And we began this line of questioning by talking about who suffers. Hospitality employment in general is going to keep crashing. But I do think, as I said, it's the American people who are going to be the big losers because Main Street USA, those those taxes that go to keep the roads paved, put books on school uh, desks, um, people don't understand how big the collective industry is. And even statewide, like here in Minnesota, our collective restaurants that put a billion dollars into our state's economy, um, you know, that number is down to 200 million. That's a huge, huge uh, problem for our state lawmakers in terms of meeting budgets. Again, we're the second largest industry in America, second only to the U.S. government. Too big to fail. Too big to fail of an industry. There's a, there's a by the way, I went on your website. It's a yellow and blue color. Uh, we're going to put the link below for others to go see the whole thing about uh, what you're doing with your uh, restaurants. But, uh, you know, you said a lot there. 73% in New York didn't waive, this is the, the owners didn't waive rent, 80% didn't pay, which is a wash because whether you waive or not, I don't have the money to pay you. So what do you mean you're not going to waive it? I don't have anything. To yeah. Pay. Yep. Customers coming in. So you want me to go out of business Then you're not going to get me for two years. Now you got an empty place sitting there. So commercial industry is taking a massive hit. Hit. So, Huge. You're explaining 50 million people tied to the restaurant. That makes a lot of sense. Let me, let me ask you, how close are you uh, or who is the most close person right now working to the Trump administration that's showing these types of stats where they're sitting there saying, you know, this makes a lot of sense. We have to save the restaurant business. Who is the main voice that's spearheading that message to them? Great question. Um, About four or five weeks ago, Kudlow, Mnuchin, Vice President Pence, President Trump, Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump, invited a group of restaurant leaders into the White House for a lengthy meeting. I think there were 12 invited guests. Three of them uh, were co-founding members of our independent restaurant coalition from saverestaurants.com. So we actually had a seat at the table there. There were several other uh, restaurant industry uh, types there, people from 
uh, big, big giant chains all the way down to single operators. But we got to get our message uh, across. And it was because of that meeting uh, that we were able to not only get uh, it was because of that meeting that Representative uh, Dean Phillips of Minnesota and Chip Roy, Republican of Texas, were able to introduce the act that was the PPP fix that extended it from eight weeks to 24 weeks, right? Uh, and the reason that the president signed that bill uh, was uh, after it passed was because of that meeting. He heard what he needed to hear at that meeting and turned to Secretary Mnuchin and others and said, you think I should do this? And they were like, well, this is a, you know, we were building a plane in, in midair and PPP does have some issues and, you know, we want to be able to extend the runway. We don't have to give any more money. We're just extending the runway of forgiveness and reorganizing the, uh, the terms of those forgivable loans, right? To have it make more sense, not just for restaurants, by the way, but for small businesses all across America. One of the problems was the length of the loan. The other problem was that it was 75% uh, payroll, 25% uh, utilities, rent, and other costs, and it went to 60-40 and from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Um, but we had a seat at that table, and we got a chance to talk to the secretaries and to the vice president, uh, and for a little bit to the president about the uh, Restaurant Stabilization Act. So I have, I have cautious optimism, but I still have optimism. And I look, I'm not going to lie to you. Anyone has, all anyone has to do is look at my work on MSNBC, look at my social media feeds, and, and I think everybody understands that I'm quite left of center. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not quite on Karl Marx's left knee, but I'm sort of on his right knee while he's reading me a book. That was a joke. Uh, <laughs> but I'm definitely, I, I am definitely uh, uh, left of center. The, uh, the, and, and my point is, is that, you know, at his core, President Trump's business advisors understand that that $120 billion that we're asking for is very small compared to what would happen if, I mean, just the employees on, on uh, unemployment for another six months dwarfs that number, right? So it's not, can we afford the 120 billion? We definitely can't afford not to give out the 120 billion. So are you full on communist or would you say you're socialist right before communist? Because I'm, I'm neither. I was, I was, I was making a joke. I'm, I'm very socially progressive. I'm, I'm Oh, very nice. It was very, Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto on Atlas Shrug. These uh, these men are sitting here in a ball. They're debating those two books. So I love that. I love that. Um, I'm deaf. I mean, look, I am uh, I am someone who is a, a very civic minded and political person. I've been involved in a lot of social justice activism uh, since my parents got me involved as a young child in the '60s. Um, growing up in New York in a, uh, in a very progressive family. Um, and you know, I believe it's my civic responsibility, uh, to be an active voice. And probably more importantly, um, when my TV career took off, um, I felt that if you have a platform and you don't do something good with it, um, you have, you've left a hole in the ground that can't be filled somewhere else. And, um, you know, I, I was determined to devote 25% of my time and 25% of my money uh, to social justice causes that I believed in. And I started doing a lot of board work and I started getting involved in a lot of national and international programs. Um, people can go to my website, andrewzimmern.com and click on our resources and our partners page to see the type of groups I'm involved in. But you know, I'm on the board of services for the underserved in New York, uh, the IRC, not the Independent Restaurant Coalition, the International Rescue Committee that Einstein founded in 1939, refugee, uh, do a lot of refugee work, work with a lot of organizations. I'm on a lot of boards. I try to work on homelessness and hunger and addiction issues and, and the like. And it, it's really been in the last three years as I've seen the work that my parents undertook for a lifetime away from their businesses 
uh, the work that so many people have done for uh, on the social justice side and to promote equality in America for everyone and seeing that under attack definitely got me more civically involved and definitely got me more politically involved. And I made a conscious choice uh, that while, you know, my new show Family Dinner on Magnolia is definitely a, uh, a treacly sweet piece of entertainment, um, but it's about connecting with families over food, something that I believe does have healing properties. And I wanted America to see what it looked like for families to spend more time together eating, because I believe that uh, we'd be better off as a nation if we all spent a little more time together over a table of food. But by that same token, I'm also making a show called What's Eating in America at MSNBC, which is very civic oriented, which is very issue oriented, uh, which does not pull any punches. And we explore everything from voter suppression to climate change to food and wellness and addiction, et cetera. Well, so again, like I asked you earlier to confirm, it's very important. It's fair to say you don't have a picture of President Trump on that wall anywhere else, right? You, you uh, have- that, 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 would be, that would be correct. Um, I, have, I have pictures of Joe Namath uh, during his most anarchy-plagued years uh, the New York Jets, when he was the owner of a famous bar in New York called Bachelors Three, and he's in the he signed it to me. Also, it's it's uh, he's in the fur coat, the mink coat, sitting on the bench with the sunglasses, the the Broadway Joe era with the long hair. You know, my heroes uh, are uh, are definitely not members of this administration. Very cool. All good. Thank you for uh, sharing that, and I think it's fair to say that Joe Namath has probably partied harder than you and I combined. Although I don't know your background or party, and I know Joe is a hardcore partier. Some lighthearted questions. We covered a lot of politics. We covered a lot of different business stuff. I'm just curious, you know, for somebody who loves caviar, what is the best kind of caviar for me to look for? If you were to say, let me educate you on caviar for two minutes, what could you educate me on about caviar? I grew up in Iran. I lived there for 10 years, lived at a refugee camp in Germany for two years. I grew up by uh, my family owned the place by Bandar Pahlavi back in the days, which was by Caspian Sea. And the caviar there was delicious. But I'm curious to hear your feedback and thoughts on caviar. Jeez, well, the first thing is, is that why aren't we standing together somewhere in a kitchen, socially distanced, cooking together? What I would refer to generically, because it's a broader geographic footprint of Persian cuisine at the, at the, uh, you know, at the height of uh, that culture's influence um, in Central Asia and the middle, and what is now the Levant in Central Asia, um, I'm not sure there's a there's a a broader and wider cuisine. It's one of the one of the world's truly great great cuisines, and I love Persian food. I don't have to educate you about a caviar. I'm sure you know a lot about it. I often tell people it's whatever you think tastes good. Let's start there. These are salted fish eggs. Not everyone has the flavor for it, but if you do, um, I do try to take people away from lump fish roe and other things that are sort of like pretend caviars. But then the issue that gets raised is uh, the cost. And what's, uh, you know, I'm hoping as more, and it's part of the reason why I actually promote what caviar eating that I do, not to pat myself on the back or to, you know, uh, claim some sort of elitist uh position. It's just that my hope is, since it's one of my favorite foods, that we can invest more in aquaculture because every year, the the more companies that get involved in this stuff, the lower the price uh, drops. Now, the caviar industry is, like many other food industries, boomed over the last 10 years, uh, whether it's farms, sturgeon farms in Taiwan that I visited um, or ones in Florida. I mean, I've, I've told stories about caviar production, aquaculture caviar production in six or seven different countries around the world over the course of the last 15 years. But now they have no one to sell to because restaurants are closed, um, which is very, very sad. I will tell you that while uh, the great true Malasol, low salt, beluga caviar, Ocetra, whatever your size preference is, something firm, something that really pops in the mouth, something that has a beautiful balance of salinity. While for some people, they automatically assume that costs a lot. I did a story in Oklahoma about mm, five years ago 
on the Oklahoma Department of Natural Resources. And they were trying to, uh, they have a wild paddlefish population there. Oklahoma and Missouri, the only states in America where wild paddlefish exist and they can be fished. You get a license and you're allowed to pull X number of fish out of the water. But the paddlefish in Oklahoma actually go to go through two egg laying seasons, right? So a lot of these farm uh, fishermen would open up their fish and fillet them. And paddlefish is quite delicious. And uh, magically, they found that people were throwing away these five, six pounds of roe that was inside the wild paddlefish. Well, the Department of Natural Resources guys had seen one of my older shows from 10 years ago in Missouri, where I was actually with fishermen fishing the paddlefish, and I actually made homemade caviar by salting the eggs, and then I took whole sets of it. And much of the same way we fry other sets of egg roe, sliced it in pieces, lightly floured it, fried it, served it with scrambled eggs and toast and butter. It's delicious. Just fry it medium rare. The same way you would shad roe in, the, in Maryland and, uh, or smoked cod roe in Ireland and England and Scotland. And these Oklahoma DNR guys had se seen the Missouri show. They sent one of their own to caviar school, and now they make wild paddlefish caviar from Oklahoma that is so blank and delicious. 99% of the caviar in my pictures, you can see me making reference to it. I think you go to the Oklahoma DNR uh, page and make your way to it. Um, it's very inexpensive. It's really good. And all the money that from the caviar program goes to support the uh, water systems in the state parks in the state of Oklahoma. So if you Google wild Oklahoma paddlefish caviar, it'll probably take you right to uh, the website where you can order it. Wild Oklahoma paddlefish caviar. Caviar. I'm going to look it up and I'm going to order it. And, uh, I've, I've sent it to, I mean, there are chefs. I've, I've been, I, I have no financial stake in this. There's no, this is not a sponsored thing at all. I just happen to love this story so much and all the money goes to help the the streams and rivers and forests in Oklahoma. And so one of the amazing things, I've turned all my chef friends onto it in blind tastings and they all go, wow, that's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's, I, I can tell this, you know, we're not talking about, you know, Primo, but we're talking about something that's a rock solid B plus. Then I tell them what it is. Then I tell them the price and they lose their minds. There's more restaurants now buying and selling this stuff because I've just been bringing it to food festivals, doing it at, at dinners and all the rest of it. Uh, it's very inexpensive as in uh, single digit hundreds of dollars for a kilo. Wow. And it's delicious. The article here, April 12th, uh, 2016, how Oklahoma cornered the market in caviar, National Geographic. <laughs> there you go. Yes, I'm going to look that up. So that's good to know. Now, here, here's the other thing. I've eaten at a lot of different restaurants worldwide. I'm a foodie myself. I love great food. You know, whether it's from a hole in the wall sushi spot where the chef, the owner makes it and you can trust his work to a high end restaurants in Monaco, Le Louis the 15th or a nice restaurant hole in the wall, La Vitrola in Cartagena, Colombia to all these other places. You've been all over the world. I've seen By the way, I know I know both. I've dined in both of those last two restaurants. Here. at Cartagena and at Le Louis. The Louis, the Louis Cans in Monte Carlo, I went there when Alain Ducasse was a young chef and arguably the best chef in the world. And he had just gotten three stars for two different restaurants. I was a young cook. This was in the 80s. I was staging in a restaurant in Paris that Alain Senderin was the chef at called Larc Estrada, Alain Senderin's first Michelin three star. And a whole bunch of us drove down and for three days, we showed up at 5.30 or six o'clock when they opened to see if there was a table in our crappy blazers, you know, and I mean, you know, young grubby cooks and it changed my life. That meal, I, I had never seen and it was the first time and now it's, now it happens more frequently. I can name a 25 restaurants in America that do it. But at the time, 1982, 83, 84, I had never seen butter churned in a kitchen 
and the bread baked in the kitchen, both according to the reservation chart. They were churning butter multiple times a day. So the butter was never refrigerated at the Louis Caz in Monte Carlo. The buildup under the cap of the churning machine was actually whipped away from the separation, right? They would take that whey and they would constantly, every hour, scrape off a few tablespoons. And that's what they would use to delicately saute, use it like a cuisson, just to glaze root vegetables for one of the lamb dishes. When you think of the lengths that restaurant was going to, just with that simplest of ingredients, butter, you get and bread, you get an idea of, of what I had never had an experience like that. And it changed my food life uh, forever. You know, it's crazy you said that. You said you you went there when the when the 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 chef who went to, I read his article that he went at 28 years old from a one star to two star to a three star in three years. And he was like the legendary one uh, worldwide that everybody, and by the way, they still do the butter. It's in display. You see the show when they're doing it, when you go into the place. Oh, do they do they do that now? Because before it was hidden away in the kitchen. In the middle, it's really what you were telling me. I was watching and I'm like, what are they doing over there? And then they come and they tell you about it. So you eloquently explained that. But uh, out of all the places you've eaten, out of all the places you've been, what's your number one where you say, if money's not an issue, if I want to take my friends, if I want to go to a place and sit down and enjoy food, my number one is dot, dot, dot. What is that place for you? Oh, my gosh. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. And I would answer it differently today than I did a couple years ago. A couple years ago, I might have said something like, you know, let's go and do the vegetarian tasting menu at Arpege in Paris. Let's go to one of the three-star Michelin uh, restaurants in Tokyo, right? Let, let's go and really celebrate in the, in the private room at, you know, uh, Alinea and tell them to really put on the feedback for us, right? I mean, just to have that over-the-top experience. I love that kind of dining. I truly do. Because I love seeing what a chef can do, that kind of chef, at the peak of his powers with ingredients, the transformational things that they do with food, the, the techniques that are going to be used 30 years later once it trickles down to, you know, home cooking. But I think what's most, what's notable and powerful for me are the places where I can share more food with more people. On the island of Palawan in the Philippines, there's a, a bunch of floating restaurants. You, you, some are at the end of a dock. They've built a rickety dock half mile out into the water. There's, I, I wrote about one in, in my first book, you know, a place where I can go, where the fishermen come in and they, they, they lift the fish and the, shellfish and the mollusks up into the center of the restaurant through a big hole cut in the middle of it. The restaurant is on stilts in the water where you can watch the sun go down, where you're sitting on the water, where the bananas for frozen banana drinks are cut from a giant ripe banana plant that was tree ripened that's sitting by the bar, where the limes are grown in the backyard of someone's house and picked and brought in where everything is so fresh and so simple. And it's really a matter of whether you want your fish or shellfish, you know, grilled raw or saute. That's the only way we do it. Pick your poison. Those are the kind of places that really thrill me the most. It has as much to do with location and simplicity of food um, as it does uh, with the quality of what's being cooked. Because I think the quality now means something different to me. Um, I've seen all the pyrotechnics. I've seen all the fancy stuff. Um, you know, you talked about Cartagena. In Medellin, there's a, a pollo al carbon, you know, charcoal roasted chicken is what's eaten. Every street has a different pollo al carbon place. But there are a couple that do it a lot better than the others, right? You know, give me a good pollo al carbon place and a lot of really cold, frosty root beer, 
and 30 of my closest friends and let us just sit there for hours and get messy with our fingers, eating pollo a carbon, uh, going out into the street and buying a sugarcane juice with lime and mint crushed with it. I'm happy as a clam there. Last night, I shooting an episode of Family Dinner. I, I was eating with a Nigerian family and uh, they, they did a version of burning meat on skewers, something that all over Africa, you go into neighborhoods and it's just, people build a fire, throw a grill on top of it and you can actually pick your cut. Typically the animal is uh, there being butchered on the back table and you can point and say, I want a little shoulder. I want a little luxury cut because everything costs a different price, right? They, they know the luxury cuts are more expensive than cuts from the, the leg or the tendon or the neck or the cheek. Um, and, you know, you sit there and you order it. Same thing in the, you know, Jamal Fana in Marrakesh, you know, in the Sukh there, where with lamb, it's the same. You order the Meshwi and they pull a little bit from different parts of the animal and they put it on a piece of newspaper and they spill a little bit of cumin, chili and salt mixture on the plate for you to season your own lamb with. And you eat it with your fingers. And if you want bread, they send a kid around the corner to the bread place and he comes back with that and some hot or cold mint tea. I, I'd rather eat in a place like that almost. If, if you said, Andrew, let's you and I go to one place for dinner tonight, anywhere in the world, it might be to some of the markets that I've been to in small villages, jungle markets in the Vietnamese countryside where spring rolls and grilled fish and shrimp salads and just, just the, the food that you just you want to just keep eating for the rest of your life. You pinch yourself. It's so good is being made fresh. I remember being in uh, Isan, Thailand, up in the north on the La uh, Laotian border, just about well, 30 miles from Vientiane, but about five, eight miles in from the Laotian border. And I was on a farm and they told me that they were going to make uh, a shrimp salad, a drunken shrimp salad for dinner. And I knew that, you know, you take the small shrimp and they're live and you drown them in rice wine and then you mix it with toasted rice powder and chili and ginger and garlic and uh, fish sauce and sugar and mint and cilantro and crushed peanuts and tomatoes. Uh, and you have this just fantastic shrimp salad. It's one of my favorite dishes uh, in the Vietnamese culinary canon. And grandma went down to the river with her net and started taking these freshwater shrimp out of the out of the river. I don't think I'd eaten anything that good. I, you know, I would put that dish up against anything that I've eaten anywhere on planet earth. Right. Um, food is not just about the expense. You know, I mean, that's why the caviar conversation used to make me uncomfortable. Um, and, and I have it freely with people where I have the opportunity to explain it because the fact of the matter is, is that the food that I find is the most precious is the stuff that's only available on what I call the last stop on the subway. The further away you have to go to get it, the more valuable it is. A year ago, if you and I want to have a great meal in New York, right? I mean, between the two of us, we can call up friends. We can get into any restaurant we want as a deuce, right? We'll eat at the bar. We'll have an amazing meal. The chef will throw all kinds of free stuff at it. The bartender will keep us happy. And we're going to have a good time, you and I, any restaurant. But what we can't do is be out in a, a village in Botswana with a big fat yellow African moon rising up over the Aha Hills while a goat is slowly roasting over the fire while people are playing the same music that their ancestors played for 40,000 years. We can't, how do we, we can't buy that. That's the precious experience that, I got to have for 14 years on the road making bizarre foods and other shows um, that I miss. That was an amazing era in my life to be able to have all those experiences and know what that feels like. And by the way, have that same meal, but have it be moose with the Athabascan tribe while it's 30 degrees below zero in front of a bonfire while they're white, they're spearing white fish on the very last night of the season before the river freezes for good. I mean, that's, that's the, that's where I'd want to take you and my friends is to eat that because the look on your face at the fancy restaurant in Paris would be, Holy crap. This is amazing. I take you up to Athabascan country 
and you're like, you're in so much clothing, you can't move. And someone puts boiled white fish right out of the river in your face, by the way, that you speared and risked your life. Cause if you fall in the water, you're dead. It's so cold. They can't get you to the fire fast enough. They lose a couple of people every season, usually elderly folks who've been drinking too much. Um, you really will enjoy that white fish because the environment in which we're consuming it together is conducive to a real human connection that I don't think you necessarily get in a fancy restaurant. Let me tell you, uh, 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 you know, I wonder how you talk dirty to the ladies because your last seven minutes of my, whatever you did with food, I am so hungry right now. <laughs> I can't wait to go eat at any of those places. But it's crazy you're saying this because it took me back to a, a time I went to Guatemala back in 2005 and we were driving to Guatemala. Guatemala is not known as a rich place. And then you go to this place and it's called Puerto Rico. It's amazing. And they say, well, this is a place where European people live. I'm like, European people live in Guatemala? Yeah, Puerto Barrios. And we went to this place, hole in the wall, you ate, but they brought the lobster, they brought the food. It's one of the best dish I ever had. Look, I've really enjoyed the conversation with you. And it's interesting to hear a story of somebody who at 14 years old gets inspired by oysters and a man who's born on 4th of July who likes capitalism because improves the restaurant business. What would your final thoughts be to small business owners who own restaurants and folks who are in restaurant business right now who are a little worried? If you have final words, final thoughts for them, what would you say to them? Um, food people, despite the gloom and doom that I talked about before, I do believe there's going to be a Stabilization Act passed. But more importantly, the most creative, the most free thinking, the most giving, sharing, coolest people in the world are food people. Uh, with apologies for everyone else out there. I've been around food people my whole life. They have the biggest hearts. They're the, they, they, they have pivoted three or four times already since February. I think, I think the, the, the higher power that I believe in puts the large burdens on the shoulders of people that can handle it. And while this has been a horrific moment for restaurants, it's also been a very freeing one. Our industry was very brittle and fragile, and it was also had a lot of inequity in it. Uh, I mean, people forget three years ago, the, the Me Too movement that, you know, rampaged through our industry. Um, the, the fact that we've mistreated, you know, people of color working in our kitchens and depressed prices and not paid a fair wage and not been able to offer benefits to these workers and and dignified the back of the house side of the profession from the dishwasher to the porter to the prep cook, right? We've, we've deified the chef, right? We've professionalized the server and the mixologist. We don't even call them bartenders anymore. But we have an opportunity now. I would have liked to have taken our house apart brick by brick before we rebuilt it. Instead, someone burnt it to the ground. COVID-19 burnt it to the ground. We would be stupid to rebuild it in the same uh, format that we did before. I think there are people, restaurateurs, food people all over this country figuring out a better, smarter way. I think we will come out of this. We will look back 20 years from now on a 10-year period post-COVID-19 that we will call the golden age of restaurants because we will have figured out a way both to honor the food, the farmer, the planter, the picker, the cook, we will be able to honor every single person equitably along that whole food chain. And I think we're going to be better off for it as a society. And I think food people will drive that decision making. I mean, one creative idea that you've seen in the last few months in the restaurant business that other restaurant businesses can implement. One creative idea. Uh, gather your best um, uh, purveyors and package their goods in a food box that goes to families. Now, some people have done it based around, uh, there's a local restaurant here called Grand Cafe, which sold you four meals for four people for X number of dollars with everything labeled and all the rest of that uh, for folks that wanted to cook a little more adventurous, adventurously at home. Other people like Dan Barber up at uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns has just accumulated cheese from his cheese people, meat from his meat people, seafood from his seafood people, charcuterie from his charcuterie people. 
you know, tomatoes from his tomato people and put them in a big box and said, every week you're going to get this box for X number of hundreds of dollars. You don't have to go to the supermarket. We're putting in a little bit of everything for you. I think that's an area beyond takeout and delivery that is really, really, really important. A lot of people in America, not all, but a lot, would like to be eating cleaner, healthier food, less of it, higher quality. And I think restaurants can provide that for their uh, neighbors and communities. Andrew, thank you so much for being a guest, folks. We're going to put the link below of uh, what he's spearheading right now to go visit. And if you support it, you can support it as well. Appreciate you for being a guest on Value Tim, and I really enjoyed the time with you. I loved having a real conversation with somebody who asks really provocative questions and loves my subject matter as much as I do. And for anyone interested, we have a lot of information at andrewzimmern.com, not only uh, issues of the day and resources, uh, but incredible uh, charities to support, as well as thousands and thousands of videos and recipes and all that kind of stuff. It's a fun award-winning website. I'm really proud of the people here in my group that put it together. So please go visit andrewzimmern.com. We'll put both the links below. Andrew, again, thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. I got to tell you, I went into this interview thinking we're going to go into the restaurant direction. He went purely politics right off the bat and was incredible. I mean, I learned a lot and I enjoyed this interview to know what the restaurant industry is really experiencing. The 50 million people that are somehow, some way directly connected to the restaurant business was mind boggling. And if you enjoyed this interview, I think you would also enjoy sit down I had with Chad Sullivan, who's a cattle rancher, and he broke down the effects of what's happening to the meat industry from a, from a perspective that you and I, if we're not in that industry, we don't understand. It got one and a half million views in the first week because people really wanted to know where is the meat made out of? And is it important? Should we know where the meat is made out of? So if you've not watched it, go ahead and click over here to watch that interview. Uh, a very, very interesting interview. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.